Understanding, of course, the choice is yours as to whether or not you make it better or worse. But the significant, profound thing you've done is simply this. You have said, I don't care how good my life is or I don't care how bad my life is, there is something I can do that will make it better. In other words, you have assumed the responsibility, and that's really where it starts, of making your life a better one. You see, you are what you are and where you are because of what's gone into your mind. You can change what you are. You can change where you are by changing what what goes into your mind. Now what that really says, if you don't like who you are and where you are, don't worry about it. You're not stuck either with who you are or where you are. You can grow or to, you can change. Now why did that gate agent change very dramatically? He changed because he was motivated. Now, a lot of people misunderstand motivation. To motivate literally means to pull out or to draw out that which is on the inside. Inside of you, my friend, there really is greatness. What we are going to do here is start to draw out the greatness which is inside of you. In the last 20 years, I have literally invested an average of over three hours a day in reading and research mostly about human nature and human development and growth and improvement and how do you develop and use what is inside of you. If there's anything I've been totally convinced of, it is this. 98% of the people in our Western civilization have a picture of themselves which is so narrow and so shallow that it literally bears no resemblance to the real person who is there. So many people have been told so many times what they cannot do that they have no idea what they can do. They have no idea what they want in life because they have no idea what is available to them. The picture they have of themselves will not permit themselves to see some of the magnificent things that are available. One of the most beautiful stories I think I've ever heard about changing the picture and what happens when you do is the story is told by Brian Harbour in his beautiful book, Rising Above the Crowd. When little Ben Hooper was born all of those years ago in the foothills of East Tennessee, little boys and girls who had no idea who their daddies were were ostracized and treated horribly. By the time little Ben was three years old, he knew he was different. The other children refused to play with him almost completely. Parents were saying insane things like, what's a boy like that doing playing with our children as if the child had anything to do with his own birth? By the time he was six years old and in the first grade, he was a very lonely child. They gave him a little desk as they did all of the children, and he stayed in his desk at recess to study. The other kids wouldn't play with him. They went out to play. At lunch, he literally went off by himself with his little sack lunch, and he ate his lunch alone. Uh, little Ben Hooper had an enormously tough childhood. Saturday was the toughest day of all. Every Saturday, his mom would take him down to the little store to buy the supplies. Invariably, there would be other adults in there. And those adults would say cruel things like, did you ever figure out who his daddy is? It's tough childhood. When little Ben was 12 years old, a new preacher came to that little church in the foothills of East Tennessee, and almost immediately, little Ben started hearing some exciting things about him, about how loving he was and understanding he was, how when you're with him, you always felt better. He gave you his undivided attention, making you feel like you were the only person around. And Ben decided one Sunday to go to church. Now, he'd never been to church a day in his life. Life. He got there late and he left early. He did not want to attract any attention, but he liked what he heard. He was back there the next son and the next and the next and the next. He always got there late. He always left early. He wanted to attract absolutely no attention. On about the sixth or seventh Sunday, the message was so moving and so powerful and so significant. It was so encouraging and so uplifting that this child of unknown heritage for the first time in his life 
literally saw a picture of hope. Now, hope is the most important ingredient we can inject in our lives. My good friend, Dr. John Maxwell from San Diego, California says, if there's hope in the future, there is power in the present. Little Ben saw hope that day, full blown for the first time. He was so enthralled with the message. He was so excited about what he was hearing. He became so wrapped up in it, he forgot all about the time. And suddenly the services were over. He stood up to leave as he always had, hoping he could beat a hasty retreat as he always had. But this time, the other people stood up simultaneously and he was having to deal with a group of people. As he worked his way through the crowd, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned, he looked around and he looked up and he was looking directly into the eyes of the young minister. The young minister asked him a question which had been on the minds of every person there for the last 12 years. Whose boy are you? Instantly, there was a deathless silence in the church. You could hear the proverbial pin drop. Then slowly, a smile started to appear on the face of the young minister until it broke into a huge grin as he said, Oh, I know whose boy you are. Why, the family resemblance, it's unmistakable. You are a child of God. And with that, the young minister swatted him across the rear and said, that's quite an inheritance you've got there, boy. Now go and see to it that you live up to it. Many, many years later, Little Ben Hooper said that was the day he was elected governor of the state of Tennessee and later re-elected. The picture had changed. When the picture changes, absolutely everything changes. But when we get new pictures of ourselves, we start setting new goals in our life. Now, when I start talking about new pictures and new goals, I think one of the most remarkable stories I have ever heard is the story of Viktor Serebriakov. Viktor Serebriakov, and I know that's a tongue twister of a name, but Viktor, as a 16-year-old, was told by his teacher, you're a dunce. You're never going to make it. Drop out of school. Get you a job. At least support yourself. Well, here's a voice of authority saying you're not going to make it. He dropped out of school. And for the next 15 years, he was an itinerant doing dozens of different things. Every morning, he got up and dressed a dunce, shaved a dunce, went to work as a dunce, performed as a dunce, thought as a dunce, and received a dunce's wages. Then for whatever reason, at age 31, they did a psychological evaluation on Victor, and they came to him and they said, Victor, we got some wonderful news for you. We have scientific evidence that's validated. There's absolutely zero doubt about it. And you, Victor Serebriakov, are not a dunce. You are a genius. You have an IQ of 161. Now let me emphasize a point. They did not give him 10 steps to do anything. They didn't give him any magic formulas. They didn't teach him anything new. The only thing they taught him was the most important thing of all. They validated the fact you are a genius. You are not a dunce. From that moment on, he got up and shaved a genius. He dressed as a genius. He went to work as a genius. He thought as a genius. He performed as a genius. And he backed up to the genius's pay window. Since then, he's written several books. He's an enormously successful businessman. One year, he was the international chairman of the Menza Society, and you got to have an IQ of 140 just to get in that. You see, when the picture changed of himself from dunce to genius, his performance changed. When you change the picture, everything about your life will change. I completely relate to that because for 24 years of my adult life by choice I weighed well over 200 pounds 
Now, the reason I say by choice is simple. You see, I have never accidentally eaten anything. <laughs> it's always been by choice. And when I choose to eat too much today, I have chosen to weigh too much tomorrow. This might stun some of you as you view this presentation, but when my youngest daughter was a little girl, I taught her to call me Fat Boy. The reason I taught her to call me Fat Boy was that's the picture I had of myself. Now let me emphasize a point. I was overweight because I ate too much. But the reason, the why I ate too much is very simple. You see, I had to eat too much. And the reason I had to eat too much is because I had a picture in my mind, and that picture simply said, Fat Boy. Now, when I changed the picture, I took the weight off and kept it off permanently. When you change the picture, everything changes. When you change the picture, you set up new goals. And you see, basically, I believe all of us want the same thing. I believe any person who ever sees this presentation, I believe every individual in this live audience wants to be happy. You know, thus far in my lifetime, I've never yet met a living, breathing human being who said, no, I want to be miserable. Everybody wants to be happy. Just one word about happiness. There's a dramatic difference between happiness and pleasure. One is much longer lasting, the other is of short duration. Basically, other people can give you pleasure. But I'm going to tell you, you will never be happy until you do something for somebody else. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to be at least reasonably prosperous. And I know, I know, there are a bunch of you who will watch this who want to be unreasonably <laughs> prosperous. And that's okay. I've had money and I haven't had money, and it's better to have it. it you know, it really is. Most people don't have it because they don't understand it. <laughs> but now let me emphasize a point. I think this is very important that we understand it. There are a lot of things money will buy, and when you need money, there are very few substitutes. But there are some important things that money won't buy. It'll buy you a house, but not a home. It'll buy you a bed, but not a good night's sleep. It will buy you a companion, but not a friend. It will buy you pleasure, but not happiness. See, I just happen to believe that if the picture you have of yourself is correct, you can have the complete success that we're talking about, the whole ball game. Not only happy, healthy, and reasonably prosperous, but you can be secure and have friends and peace of mind, and you can have those good family relationships. Now, your question might really be, Ziegler, can you really have it all? I honestly, sincerely believe that you can, but you got to understand you got to be before you can do. You got to do before you can have. I'm not necessarily going to tell you it's going to be easy, but I am going to tell you over and over, it absolutely is going to be worth it. I'm totally convinced of that. A lot of the music of our time sings that old refrain, I want to be free. But I want you to think about this. You take the train off the tracks, it's free, but it can't go anywhere. Take the steering wheel out of the automobile, it's under the direction and the control of no one, but it cannot even move. I want you to think about this, and this is so significant here with our whole presentation. The sailor only has freedom of the seas when he has become a slave to the compass. Until he is absolutely obedient to the compass, he's got to stay within sight of shore. But once he has become obedient to that compass, he can take that boat anywhere in the world. Uh, you see, discipline and commitment is what I'm really talking about. And if that picture of yours is like it should be, then you are willing to uh, enjoy the benefits which come from doing the things that are absolutely necessary. But let me say it again, it's not necessarily going to be easy. I love the story told by my friend Joel Weldon from Phoenix, Arizona, about the Chinese bamboo tree. They plant the seed, they water it, and they fertilize it, but the first year nothing happens. 
The second year, they water it and they fertilize it and nothing happens. The third year, they water it and fertilize it and nothing happens. The fourth year, they water it and they fertilize it and nothing happens. The fifth year, they water it and they fertilize it. And sometimes during, in the fifth year, in a period of pro approximately six weeks, the Chinese bamboo tree grows roughly 90 feet. But did it grow 90 feet in six weeks? Or did it grow 90 feet in five years? When you think about it, we understand it grew 90 feet in five years because had there been no year or a year when they did not water it and fertilize it, there would have been no Chinese bamboo tree. Life's pretty much like that. A lot of times we will work and work and work and nothing happens. We'll work and work, nothing happens. We work some more and some more and some more and nothing happens. And when one day, all of a sudden, everything seems to explode and all of your friends will say, you always were one of the lucky ones. <laughs> but the reality is, the only way you're going to persist is that picture of you simply says, I am a winner. Here's what I've got to do in order to win. And like the Chinese bamboo tree story, you keep watering and fertilizing it. How do you change the picture? Well, one we just discussed. The positive input in your mind over and over and over. You see, you are what you are and where you are because of what's going into your mind. You can change what you are. You can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. How do you change a picture? You listen to others. Let's listen to what Emerson had to say. He said, what lies behind you and what lies before you pales in significance when compared to what lies within you. He also said, ability without honor has no value. The way you maintain that good picture is to remember that right there, so significant. I love what St. Augustine also said in 399 A.D., and I paraphrase him, he said, man travels hundreds of miles to gaze at the broad expanse of the ocean. He looks in awe at the heavens above. He stares in wonderment at the fields and the mountains and the rivers and the streams. And then he passes himself by without a thought. God's most amazing creation. Listen to what he said. He's talking about you. I love what Ethel Waters said. She was at a Billy Graham crusade one night in London, England. The stadium was absolutely packed, tens of thousands of people. And a man came to Ethel Waters and said, Ethel, how do you account for this tremendous success that Billy Graham is having? How does he attract all of these people? And Ethel Waters spoke for all of us when she answered with that big, beautiful smile of hers. And as only Ethel Waters could, she said, Honey, God don't make no junk. I'm here to tell you that is so true. How do you change the picture? How do you maintain the right attitude? How do you reap a lot of the benefits? I'm absolutely convinced that the gratitude attitude is our one of the most important facets that you could possibly add to your repertoire.